Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I want to mention to you some things that are going on and um, just some uh, things that are going to be taking place that we've got coming up this um, recent or in the near future and coming up um, in the next few weeks to come and everything. Again, next Sunday, most of you know, is Valentine's Day. So you're going to, um, we'll be in church on Valentine's Day. And so a couple of things that will be taking place next Sunday. We're going to be doing something. We're not going to be having our Valentine's banquet, but we don't want to leave it out. So we're going to be doing some things on Valentine's next week for everybody that's here. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be having special Valentine cookies and special Valentine cupcakes. Now everybody likes cake. Everybody likes cookies. And they're going to be able to be given out for everybody. You don't have to be a couple to get them or anything like that. And we're going to be, uh, how many like sweets? All right, how many like sweets? We're also going to be, um, so we're going to be doing this kind of a Valentine's celebration. It's going to kind of coalesce with the service as well um, because of the things we're going to be doing in the service. And also um, with that, we're going to be having some giveaways. Now, how many of you like giveaways? We're going to be giving away um, some eating out gift cards to um, restaurants so somebody maybe want to go and give Valentine's Day. We're going to do a drawing, so we're going to need everybody to be prepared. We're going to put names in a couple different hats. We're going to have a couple of categories, okay? We're going to have we're going to have a categories for our married couples, all right? How many of you are married and are glad of it? All right. If you're married and not glad of it, you still need to raise your hand, okay? And, um, and so you're going to be able to put your name in there for a couple of drawings we're going to have for you guys. If you're single... You're going to be able to put your name in because we don't leave our singles out. You know, they can be able to go to a restaurant and eat and stuff like that. Because they might be able to find somebody at a restaurant, okay? Um, uh, certainly be better than them finding somebody in a bar. And, um, and so um, we're, going to, we're going to be doing that. We're even going to offer opportunity. We're going to have a gift, a gift opportunity for people who are dating that they can put their name in a you know, hat, you know, and so forth. So, uh, so, so we're going to have three drawings. So we're going to have these separated so you can have drawings for that. And, uh, and then you, the cupcakes you don't have to draw for. The cupcakes and cookies you get. All right? And so um, and that, whether you're married, single, or what have you, we're going to do that. And we're going to have a good time with that on Valentine's Day. And that's next Sunday. To go along with the service, how do you know God loves us? How do you know God loves us? Next Sunday, we're going to be focusing on a variety of God's love. How many of you still believe in miracles? Amen. I believe that God provides miracles. And the reason God gives miracles is because he loves his people. And so we're going to be focusing on miracles and healings and things like that. So if you know somebody needs a miracle of healing or, or a miracle in their life, um, you want to try to have them here in service. It's going to be a very exciting time because we're going to be praying for people's miracles and people's healings. And I believe that God's going to give them life because, you know what, Valentine's Day would be a great day for God's love to be shown in people's healings and miracles, wouldn't it? And so we're gonna, it's going to be a focus on that. And, and then I um, want to uh, remind you also of the Red Cross blood drive on March 17th, okay? Um, we have a sign-up sheet in the foyer. If you sign up and you don't sign up online, let us know so we can give your name. If you want to sign up online, we've already got people starting to sign up for that. That's Wednesday, March 17th. Uh, give blood. You have done an amazing job in these first two blood drives. I believe we're going to exceed it even and, and go even beyond that. And it's going to just continue to help the people in our community or, or people around, um, not just our community. My blood went to Virginia. I think that's so cool. My blood went to Virginia. And, um, and so I think that's just a neat thing that, that we have different places that our blood can go and help people. And, and so we're going to be doing that on March 17th. On March 21st, and I'm very excited about this. You know, we've been talking about being able to be a church that even through a pandemic gets to do things that, um, that, that, that we get to um, do things to try to win people to the Lord. And I was praying about it. And on Thursday, I was praying about how we can reach our community and, and so forth. And I got a call. Um, and I got a call. And, so, and, and I want to be able to reach the community in an out-of-box way. And so I got a call from someone, um, and I get calls from evangelists and things like that all the time. But this one really perked my interest, and I began to, we began to pray about it and so forth. And on March the 21st, so two weeks before Easter, it's going to be leading up to Easter, 
We're going to have a group in here on a Sunday morning and a Sunday night. And the Sunday morning is on that. It's called Power Force. And maybe many of you may remember years ago something called the Power Team. I don't know if you remember the Power Team. Well, I got a testimony of the Power Team that my son gave his heart to the Lord during a Power Team crusade. And um, when they found out that, the little guy who used to lead the Power Team and now leads the Power Force, he's actually going to be here on the Sunday morning. And they do feats of strength and stuff like that, but they share their testimony. And so that's why we're going to be doing a Sunday morning and Sunday evening. I believe that it's an opportunity for us to win. And they normally charge fees and so forth to come. They're coming strictly for a love offering for us to be able to do something in the community. They're actually, their, their whole thing is already paid for for them to be here. So we're going to be giving them love offering and, and honoring these evangelists to come to be able to win souls. How many of you think it's a, you think, well, that's weird. Guys that tear up phone books, you know, they tear phone books up. I told them, I said, listen. If you're going to tear a phone book up, you're going to have to bring one with you because Bible phone book I can tear up. Okay? Uh, it's just true, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but, um, you know, some of the things, they promise me they won't set our stage on fire because they don't use fire anymore or anything like that. Um, and they won't do cartwheels on our stage since we've only got an eight-foot ceiling on our stage. But it's going to be a great way. It's an out-of-the-box way to be able to touch people. And, and as we got the brother Frankie's son, KC, was saved during the Power Team Crusade. My son, Josh, was saved during the Power Team Crusade. And I believe some of your children and grandchildren could be saved during, the, during something like this called Power Force. And you'll be hearing more about it. We'll have videos and things like that that we're going to show. But I want you to begin praying about it now. And then uh, another thing that we're going to be doing, we'll be doing prayer tomorrow evening from 5.30 to 7. The opportunity is there. I know it's cold. We're going to pray. We're going to be having a box, and the box is going to be set up, but then there's going to be things added to it. But we're going to have a box set up for prayer. And I love the idea that uh, was given to me on this. And this is not my idea. It was kept sent to me, and I think it's a great idea. We're going to have what's called a prodigal child box. Many people have prodigal children. Children that have fallen away from the Lord, who have gone away from the Lord. And children, grandchildren. And you're going to be able to put those children, grandchildren's name in, these box, in this box. And what we're going to do is we're going to pray. And we're going to see things like the power force that's going to come in and other groups that's going to come in. And we're going to be able to go into it. And, and we're going to one by one be able to take our prodigals out of the box as we testify to them getting I mean, I don't guess you're hearing me. That you're hearing me about the excitement of the opportunity to be able to take some prodigals out of the box because they've given their heart to the Lord. All right? And, and, and we've already started up, going to have somebody that's going to be actually doing sketches that we can put on there that, that will that will give a little bit more life to it. But we're gonna have the, the prodigal box will be set up tomorrow night. We'll have it set up on 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 the prayer meeting nights. We'll have it set up on our our, our Wednesday nights for Bible study. We'll have it set up for the ladies prayer group that comes and prays every two weeks because I believe that we're gonna pray over them. God's gonna give us the ability to win them. And then we'll see prodigals come out of those boxes and and it'll be a great, wouldn't it be a great testimony if it's your grandchild or your child that you get to pull their name out of the box and you get to celebrate they came to the Lord, right? Yes. They came to the Lord. Well, I'm asking you to stand to your feet. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer. And we have several prayer needs that we want you to remember in prayer. I want you to remember Etah and her family in prayer. Today is the day that they're going to be doing the funeral service for her mom over in um, Tennessee. And so remember their family, that God would touch each and every one of them. I want to ask that you remember Brother um, Terry Garris's mom, Frances Paul, in prayer. She um, she needs to touch. Her lungs are, are are in bad shape, and she just she may even have to go in the hospital. We don't believe for God to touch her. Remember Nancy Del Rio in prayer. Um, she needs a healing. Um, Sister Barbara West. I, I talked to Brother Billy this morning. She's doing good. Um, but remember her in prayer that that she continues to do that way. And Brother Hopper needs a touch from God and, um, and pray for Brother Hopper. And then um, I want to ask you to pray for my son, Josh. Josh has um, been sick for the last two days, running fever, high fevers and so forth. And he's going to the doctor today at 1130. You don't go on Sunday unless you have to. They couldn't get in till 1130 on a Sunday. Um, but I want you to pray for him as well. Let's go before the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come into your house to worship you, to magnify you, and to honor you. God, you're so good to us. And God, we glorify you. And we thank you, dear God, that, that we can come into your house to praise you. We can come into your house to worship you. And that, Lord, worship is open, dear God, for all of us. 
God, I pray in the name of Jesus today, dear God, that you would touch these people here, dear God. Touch everyone, every man, every woman, every family member, dear God, every child, dear God, that you would minister to them, dear God, whether they're in this sanctuary or whether they're in the, the, the children's church, dear God. We pray that you would minister to us, dear God. I pray that you would touch these needs, dear God. I pray for Sister Etal, dear God, and, and I pray for her brothers, dear God, Kenny and Todd, dear God, and for Cadence, dear Lord, that you would minister to them. God, we pray for Francis, dear God, that you would touch her and give her healing in her lungs. We pray for Brother Hopper, dear God, for his healing, dear God. We pray for Sister West and her healing. We pray for um, Nancy Del Rio, dear God, and, and her healing, dear God. We pray for Josh and his healing, dear God. And I pray, dear God, we, that you would hear us right now. And Lord, we call on you knowing, dear God, you who is the healer, the author, and the finisher of our faith, dear God. We thank you for that. And God, we pray that you would pour your spirit out upon us in this service, dear God. We honor you and we love you. In Jesus' name, would you lift up your hands right now and welcome the Lord into his house? Closer to God. And isn't that the goal? The goal in life is to keep getting closer to God. 
And so the, the more we're able to give, the closer we can get to God. Now, you're not buying your way to God. You're just saying, you know what, I'm going to be like you and I'm going to be closer to you because I'm going to follow you in giving. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to bring our gifts to you, dear God, on every occasion. God, we thank you, dear Lord, that you're going to bless these gifts, dear God, and that you're going to bless the givers, dear Lord, and that you're going to touch them in an incredible, awesome way. Before you give, I want to tell you a testimony. How you like to hear good things about giving? Spending in December, you bought Christmas presents and stuff like that. In January of this year, 2021, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, things that are challenged, still at some of the most challenging times in the history of our world. Did you know that you gave the most money in January that this church has ever given in January? Oh, you didn't hear that. You gave more than this church has ever given in tithe in January. Now, how, do, how does that happen? I believe it draws us closer to God, and I believe you do so. You, you do as well. Let's worship the Lord.
to a place that you're not the same as you once were. And that you're a different deal. That's what salvation is about. It's not about being the same. It is about being changed. I want you to lift up your hand one time right now. I want you to thank Him for salvation. I mean, if you're saved and you have Him in your heart, thank Him for salvation. If you're not, you can be saved before the end of this service. God, we thank You for salvation. The greatest gift for our lives. We thank You for it right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. If there's anybody that needs You today, Lord... We pray that you would save them, whether they're here in house or whether they're watching. Lord, we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You can be seated. <coughs> well, this is a week of first for a lot of people. It was a first for me for the first time in all this stuff that's gone on for the last a year, I had to have somebody go up my nose with one of those sticks and COVID test me, all right? But now I was negative, but I didn't have it because I've been exposed or anything like that because I went to see Sister Nell at the nursing home. They said, well, before you can see her, we're gonna stick your nose. And, uh, and they did, and that's okay. But it, you know, that's a small sacrifice to get to see Sister Nell. And let me tell you, she is doing well, and she wants you to know that she loves you and that she's thinking of you. And if you want to send her a letter or want to send her a card, um, I promise you she will remember what's in it. Um, she shared with me a letter that was sent um, to her by Sister Becky. And, um, and I asked Sister Becky, did you say that? She said, yes, I did. Uh, so her mind's there, folks. She knows what's going on. I want to share with you a message this morning. I believe this is a timely message for right now. I believe it's an important message for us. It's called the bullying point. It's called the bullying point. And, and this is a very important message I want to share with you. In Luke chapter 21, it says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. Heavenly Father, I ask your God that you bless this word in our lives and that you would speak to us and speak to us this morning in a very solemn and serious way to every single one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. The bullet point, we need to be ready. We need to get ready. The bullet point of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. The bullet point of water and any other substance depends on the atmospheric pressure, which changes with elevation. At higher altitudes, the pressure is lower, and so water boils at a lower temperature. If the barometric pressure is not at the standard value, the boiling point will be different. I understand you didn't come to church to hear a science lesson on boiling water. There's a point to this for us to understand. It's perhaps an unusual perspective, but different environments and different altitudes and different attitudes may change what the boiling point is. And different things, different environments in your life may change what the boiling point is. I'm not going to ask how many of you have ever gotten to the point in your life that you're at your boiling point. That you're about to boil over and explode. We've all gotten there at points in our lives, haven't we? We've got the point that, oh, I'm so mad I'm boiling. I'm, I'm boiling hot mad. And, and we, we've, we've used that. But I want to take you to a different look at this and a different... The answer to is, is this world that we're in right now at a boiling point? Are we at a boiling point? It makes me wonder if, has the atmospheric pressure gotten to the place that the world is boiling? Has it gotten to the place that it's just about to that point, that, that, that certain area? I mean, what I mean by that is looking at the conditions of the world that doesn't appear to you that things are critical. 
I mean, if we just were to examine the things that happened in the last 12 months, would it appear to you that things are critical? It does to me. I mean, we've heard it our entire lives. You better get ready for the Lord is coming soon. You better prepare for eternity. Because this world is going to end shortly. I mean, it only takes one degree to cause something to boil. It can be below that place and it will get hot, but it may not boil. But it gets that extra degree. And that thing may begin to boil in your life. And that is how close we can be to a boiling point in the world. What is the next thing that will happen? Or what is the thing that will happen that will cause this thing to boil? That's how fragile it is. That's how fragile our circumstances are. That's how fragile life is. Think of how precise God is with how everything works. If the earth's orbit changes just a bit, one way or the other, we can either freeze to death or we can boil. We can be burned up with murderous heat. And every calamity and every obstacle we have seen through the changes in this world, we find that more and more people clamor about the end of the age. At least they used to. Through are good times and times of peace and times of safety. People lighten up and, and forget the possibility of us living in these different times, don't they? Well, things just seem to be getting a little bit better, maybe. We certainly have short memories, don't we? In fact, we have short memories when it suits us to have short memories. I've come to this morning to share truth, whether it is regarded or heeded or not. It's up to you. Whether you heed this truth, whether you regard this truth, make no mistake. I want to share with you, we are living in the last days. We are living in the last days and... And I don't think there's any mistake about it. I don't think there's any doubt about it. It may be doubt with some people, but there's no doubt in my mind that we are in the last days. And we haven't got time to waste. Nor do we have the luxury of believing that things are just going to pan out in the end. We're at a boiling point, my friend. And yes, we may see some short-term relief. We may get a, a little relief from somebody that will make us think things are, are, are better. We may, but, but in the long run, we're about to see the greatest transition in the history of this world. The greatest transition this world has ever seen. And for some, that transition may not be good. For many, that transition will be great. It depends on where you are with God. And I've come to issue a couple of warnings this morning. That's why I said this is a very serious and a very timely message. I want to issue some warnings to us this morning. Some things that we need to take heed of. Some things that we need to understand. The things that we need to look at that are in my spirit right now. And the first thing that I want to warn you about is we had better loose ourselves of the distractions. And yes, the things that we've seen over the last few months and year or so, or even beyond that, although they are very real, those things are distractions to the kingdom of God. And they are distractions to the church. And they are things that the devil wants to distract us. He wants our mind on things that it doesn't need to be on instead of those things that it should be on. The Bible says, Paul said this, he says in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without what? Without distraction. And that's what he's saying to us today. He says, I want you to serve me without distraction. Don't let the things that are taking place in this world distract you from your walk with God. You know, the things that I'm seeing take place in this world right now are causing me not to be distracted from God, but causing me to want to be closer to God. I want to be in the Word more now than I've ever been. I want to pray more now than I've ever prayed. I want to seek God more now than I've ever sought Him. Why? Because I don't want to be distracted in the times that we're in. Well, it's inevitable that we will become distracted in life. And I get distracted in certain things. Before there was ever ADD or 
anything that was qualified for that. I got distracted and I got in trouble for it. it I mean, it's most important that we remember that what we've got to do is we've got to stay focused. Everybody say focused. We've got to stay focused on the living God. And that's what we've got to stay focused on, my friends. We've got to stay focused on Him and His ways. When we learn to do this by studying His Word, my friend, if you're going to stay focused on God, you've got to be in His Word. You've got to have a prayer life. That's why it's important to pray and seek God. I, I think one of the things, we don't want to get distracted by, by our goals and the things that God has laid before us. Don't let the circumstances of the world keep us from doing what we're supposed to do for God. Whether we have to do it with a mask on or whether we have to do it with, with, our, with, with two masks or whatever, we need to serve God regardless. That's why the gospel still has to go up. That's why we need to be still going after our prodigal children and grandchildren. Why? Because the end is near, my friend. And we cannot let ourselves get distracted. It's not that the problems aren't real. It's not that the challenges aren't real. It's that those things are real, but they were intended to distract us by the enemy. And we cannot let the enemy do that. We have to put into action and be put into action by following his word. We have to not only... Get in His Word. We've got to follow His Word. And it's past time that the people of God follow the Word of God. It's not enough to read it. It's not enough to study it. We have to follow it and live it. And boy, if people will live by the Word, how will it change everything in their lives? How will it change your life if you live by the Word? Because you know what? Again, one of the distractions is, you know what? Live by the way the world says Live by the, you know, everybody else is living this certain way, so we might as well too. And, and, and we quite honestly, you, you've gotten to the place that in 2021, sometimes we can't tell the difference between the church and the world. I'm not talking about what takes place in the church. I'm talking about the way we live outside the church. Come on. It's not always easy. And it's not always easy to stay away from distractions. Boy, today's a day of distracted driving, isn't it? Anybody ever had this distracted driving? You know, you can get a ticket for distracted driving, right? Ever, ever got a call on your cell phone and say, you know what, I just, I got to answer that call because it's important, you know, something, I mean, I'm getting a call, I've got to answer it, I've got my phone, i got to answer it, and they're calling me, and so I've got to answer it, I'm one, of, I'm one of the world's worst, I get in trouble because I have to answer my phone, somebody texts me while I'm driving, my phone don't have that thing that, on it that, that says, um, I'm sorry, I can't answer your text because I'm driving right now, and so um, I, I, I try not to text and drive, I don't want to text and drive. Uh, but, but somebody texts me, so I've got to answer them right away. No, I don't. I need to not be distracted because I don't want to kill somebody, right? By being distracted, I can, I can do some damage. I preached a funeral of somebody that was texting and driving. And I preached their funeral. It's a horrible way to end your life. Distractions can do things to us. We know they're going to happen. And they, in fact, that's what distractions are intended by the enemy. They're intended to destroy us. We live in a day filled with distractions. They'll stop the work of ministry if we allow it. The enemy of your soul wants to distract us more now than ever. Why? You know why he wants to distract you more now? Because he knows the time is short. He knows that his time of being able to try to, to, to tempt and push people, it's short. And we need to learn to serve God, to serve the Lord without distraction. We need to make sure that we are serving Him without any reservation, without any interruption. Because distractions can destroy us. The world is at a boiling point. And that boiling point of this world shows us that we need to be prepared. So we need to loose ourselves of distraction. The second thing I have to warn you is this. We don't have long left. It's not going to be long. I, I don't know what that means. I can't tell you. I did not come here to pronounce a day or an hour. I didn't come here to be a prophet to announce. I, I'm coming here to be a prophet to tell you there's not long left. 
And I want to that to encourage you. You know what he tells us? Here's what he tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul said this, and I love what he says. He says, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. You know why he says that the Christian doesn't really need him to write to him? Why? Because we know what's going on. If we're not distracted, we understand the time that we're in. He said, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come to the thief of the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And we live in a world full of turmoil. But let me tell you, when the first politician says, I've got the answer, you're at peace. You better look up, my friends, because they don't have the answer, and they'll never bring peace. No, no elected politician, no appointed politician has ever brought peace to this world. And when they decide to tell you that they've got the answer for peace, they do not. The only answer for peace is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. My friends, they can tell us what they want to tell us to bring peace, but it will not, it will bring destruction. I want you to hear this. This is a word the Lord told me. Quit living your life like you have forever left. We need to live our lives just as if today is the last day. It's crucial to our walk that we treat each day as if it was the last day. Because it could very well be that. We have to act as if it, 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 that, that it seems like the, 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 that we, we, it seems as if we act as if that we have forever to make things right or that we have forever to win the law so that we have forever to go and to win our, 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 our prodigals. We don't have forever to win them. The time is short. It's critical. It's at a boiling point. That, that's how serious this is, folks. I'm not here to try to bring spirit to you. I, I, I am here to bring you a word from the Lord so that you understand the importance of this, the importance of what you do and how you live and, and what you need to do and, and for you to get in perspective today, you know what the most what's the most important thing I do? Who what is it? Is it that I touch somebody? Is that I don't allow myself to get distracted? Is that I can share with somebody one more time because I don't know what's left. We're living in a day. When people are saying, although things have been rough, they're going to get better. The government's going to fix it. They've got the, they've got this problem. You're going to get a check from them and they'll take care of it. Ooh, glory to God. I didn't. Trust your job and trust your abilities and everything will work out. Here's the truth. People can clamor all day long, but the fact of the matter is when people are thinking life is about to get better or they're trusting the wrong solution, sudden destruction is. And I'm not saying we have a bad life. As Christians, we have a good life. We have a good life serving God. But the conditions of this world, we can't walk as if we expect this world to improve. God Hear this. I, I, I'm going to tell you something. This is the gospel truth. God did not call us to improve the world. He called us to win the world. Did, did you hear me? God didn't call us to fix all the problems in the world. That's not what the church was called to do. The church is called to win the world. Now, by winning people to Christ, that helps with a lot of things, no doubt. But as long as this world is spinning, there's going to be evil in it. And what we have to realize is that water will not boil forever. It will evaporate and the pan empties. The condition of this world will not continue to boil. It won't stay boiling. Why? Because we're at the boiling point. We have to realize 
We don't have an unlimited amount of time. And that you need to heed this warning. Time is short. I understood coming in preaching this message. This isn't going to be the message that has everybody yipping and hopping and, 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 and excited. But we need to be excited for the fact that we know that our time is coming to, a, to, to, not to an end, but it's coming to a great beginning, my friend. And it ought to bring excitement to the people of God. The people of God who are not walking in darkness ought to be glad to know that God has got this thing worked out already for us. That the end is near, but the end is the beginning for us. But what do we got to do? I told you I had some warnings. We can't be distracted. But everybody, and we'll say everybody, everybody needs to break free. You know, one of the things that bothers me is people of God, first and foremost, do not have to be bound. We shouldn't be bound to sin. We should be able to be set free. They say just a few moments ago about he set me free. And did you know that he still sets us free? He can still set his people free. That, that we've got to be breaking free. And the Bible says in Psalms 116, it says, O Lord, truly I am thy servant, and I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid, and thou hast loosed my bonds. How many of you are glad of a God that looses our bonds? A God that sets us free. A God that can take us from sin and take us to, from sin and guilt and shame to freedom and deliverance and joy in our lives. That's what we can have. You see, in all this stuff that's mulling over, that God wants to, wants to mull over so that people can be set free from their sin. We've experienced too many bondages. Many of us are experiencing bondages today. You got a choice. You can either stay bound or you can get free from it. And he who the Son is set free is free indeed, is what the Word tells us. Due to the boiling point, we appear to be at the, at, at, the, at, at the place where we need to recognize that we need to break free from bondages, whatever that bondage may be. We have to break free from some of those things that are holding us down. And I believe that's what it is for the church, the kingdom of God, to be what it's supposed to be. It is time that the kingdom of God breaks free, that the kingdom of God sees the bondages broken off of it, that the kingdom of God is no longer oppressed and held down, but that we break free and we rise up to be what God has called us to be. Go ahead, y'all, and clap your hands. <laughs> Hoping for freedom will not secure freedom, but getting freedom from the King of Kings will give you the freedom you need. You understand this? We have to break those chains. I'm not talking necessarily just about sin, but things that bind us in the Spirit and the things that we've allowed to bind us in the Spirit, we need to break free of today. You need to break free of it today. You didn't say, you know what? I am tired of being held down. I am tired of being held in bondage. When you get tired enough of something, you will change. And you will allow yourself. And you will seek to be free from it. You will not allow the kingdoms of this world to overrule the kingdom of God in your life. We become so easily entangled. Relationships. Attitudes. Jobs, money, addictions. These things can hold us in place until we begin to slide. Jonathan Edwards said they begin to slide when he talked about sinners in the hands of an angry God. In Deuteronomy, we're told their feet slide in due time. It's because of bondage. So what do we need? We need to break free. How do I break free? I, I break free because I don't just have the word. I let the word have me. What does he say? In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The, the, the word was with God. You know, how many of you believe that, that Jesus Christ is the answer to everything? How many believe that Jesus Christ can, can set you free of whatever the bondage you may be walking in in your life? You see, that, that, that's the freedom that I've got. I, I want to have a He set me free mentality. I want to have a He set me free. Well, not just freedom from sin, but I, I, want, I don't want to be bound up anymore. I want to fly like that bird that was set free.
I got this box in my garage. We call it a nesting box. I built this box for my dog to have what I thought she would have five or six puppies end up being ten puppies in this nesting box. And these things are growing like crazy. And but they're stuck in this box. They can't go nowhere, Brother Don. But they're getting bigger. And so the other day, I was changing some of the material in the box because, you know, we have to keep working. The, the, these, these, these little dogs are working me to death. Can't imagine how much they're working their mom. And, and, and so one of them, I had an opening in it so the mama could climb over easy because she, you know, she just had 10 kids. And so one of them decided to climb out of that box. And it thought, I'm free. I'm free. And so I had to take a board and I had to, I had to make it higher. Because, but, but there's going to be a day in a couple of days where they're going to all climb out of that box. They're going to be all over my garage. And they're going to bust out. And there's going to be little puppies just running all over the place. And I don't know how we'll keep them in there. You know what? When I saw that, when I saw them trying to bust out of that, I saw the freedom that they had. They, they were excited about it. Folks, we've been in our box so long that we've forgotten what it was like to have true freedom. But let me tell you, when you bust out of the box, and you bust out of the box, you say, you know what? I'm not going to let the world hold me down. I'm not going to let the world keep what I've got in me. I'm getting ready to bust out of the box, and it's going to change things. And I may, I may look unusual, and I may look different from this world. You know what? It is about time the people of God busted out of the box and showed the world something different because the world absolutely needs something different. When it's time for us to break Free some of y'all be shouting right now. You know what? I'm ready to break free. I want to break free in my praise. I don't want to be inhibited in my praise. I want to break free in my walk. I want to break free in my servanthood for God. I want to break free. I'm not going to be held down. I'm ready to bust loose. Oh, more than busting loose the altar. I'm talking about busting loose in life so that you can serve God without any inhibitions. Break free. Don't let the world hold you down and hold you in. I gotta hurry. I, 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 I've gotta hurry. Fourth thing. This is heavy. We must deal with sin. The times that we're in, if we don't deal with sin, we'll never get to where we're supposed to be. But what he said in Hebrews, he said, We're foreseen, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us do what lay aside every weight and what? The sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. For, who the, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We don't talk about sin as often as we used to. It's not popular to talk about sin in church anymore. We want to talk about things that make us feel good. Things that don't convict us. Sin don't draw a crowd, it never has. Not to talk about, it just draws a crowd to do. I don't care who we are and what we believe. Here's what the Word of God says about sin. Revelation 21, it says this. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second day. You know what he's saying here? He said, look, I'm not letting sin in. I'm not letting sin enter in is what it's telling us. Did you know that God still is a God of righteousness? And that He's calling the church to repentance? That we can't afford to let sin dominate our lives? God's saying we've got to work on this. This has got to be something we work on. I mean, if we are in sin, He says we're not in Christ. 
That's the bit of the absolute truth. I'm not talking about that, that every little sin that you have in your life, is, that, that in and of itself is going to keep you from God. What you have to do is we have to learn to live a repentant life that when we sin, we are faithful, that we can confess our sins because He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what His Word says. So when you sin, repent of it. Don't hold on to it. But when you sin and you don't repent, it brings you to another sin, to another sin, to another sin, to another sin, to another sin. To another sin. And it keeps mounting and mounting and mounting until that sin becomes your mountain. I'm not saying that we have to live a perfect life. But the attitude that pushes us to repent of sin is what we've got to have. And we better become people of repentance. And we better take repentance seriously. And I believe God is saying to us today, take repentance seriously. Don't just say, I don't want to do it, but I want you to repent of it and turn away from it. And he's saying that to his people, folks. Before he'll ever say it to the world, he's saying it to his people that his people need to repent of their sin. I'm not saying that you in here have bad things going on in your life. I'm saying that we have to take sin seriously. My wife has been encouraging me to do something that I don't want to do. Anybody ever had your spouse encourage you to do something that you don't want to do? You can come to music. She looked last night or this morning into my closet. And she looked at that and she said, it's time for you to clean out your closet. We have separate closets. We don't share a closet. I said, why is it time for me to clean out my closet? I don't know where everything is. She said, it's time for you to clean out your closet. And the reality is, I don't want to clean my closet out. That's why my closet's got stuff in it that don't need to be there. Because what it tends to happen when, when we have somebody come over to the house, I've got stuff in my closet that I put in there in December of 2019 before we had the open house at the parsonage. Because this rejoice, I didn't want nobody to see that anywhere else, so I put it in my closet and it's still in my closet piled up. And you know what? It's time. Well, some of you need to hear this. It's time to clean out my closet. When it comes to sin in our lives, it's time for some people to clean out the closet. That's as simple as that. And it's, it's not intentional, it's just we let stuff build up. And when it builds up, it needs to be cleaned up. And I guess first thing I'm committing to her that I'm going to clean out my closet. Happy wife, happy life, right? But maybe we ought to clean out our own closets. That everybody, before you leave here today, clean out your closet. If there's something in your closet that don't need to be there, just clean it out. Confess it to God. Because we better be ready. We better be ready. Jude says this, and I'm closing with this. But beloved, remember ye the works, the words which were spoken before the, of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last days who should walk after their own godly, ungodly lust. These by the they, they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. That there are people that are going to mock us for saying that we're in the last days. They're scoffers. Every time somebody mocks and scoffs when we say we're in the last days, it just reminds us that the word of God is true. They're an answer to prophecy. I've come here this morning to remind the church, to warn the church for too long. We've lived as if God was going to 
sweep our faithfulness, our lack of uh, our faithlessness, our lack of commitment, and the sins under the rug. But the warning I believe the Holy Spirit wants to issue to this church this morning is to prepare yourself. We need to prepare ourselves. I want you to shut your eyes. I know that you're good people and love God. But can I encourage you to do something? Before we can ever do what we're going to be doing in March and focusing on bringing people in and, and winning people, we've got the first thing we've got to do. We've got to humble ourselves and repent. You say, Pastor, I'm not a bad person. It's not about you being a bad person. I'm with you. I'm the first one that needs to fall on my face before God and repent. And you know what? I'm ready today to clean my closet. Why? Because I do believe this. I absolutely believe this. We cannot live like we have an unlimited amount of time left. Because we don't. We are at the boiling point. I want you to bow your heads. I want you to shut your eyes. If you feel the necessity to do this, if you feel like you need to come to the altar and lay down and, 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 and pray, then you come to this altar and pray. If you feel like you need to do it in your pew, then you come to this, then, then you pray in your pew, however you feel comfortable doing this. But make yourself uncomfortable for, uncomfortable for a few minutes with God so that you can say, you know what, God, I, I, I need to... There are things in my life I need to change. I need to make sure that I'm where I need to be. I need to, I need to, I need to confess my sins. I need to repent. Whatever it is. Because I don't want any ugliness in my life to keep me from God. I don't want any distractions in my life. I don't want any oppressions in my life to keep me from God. You understand what I'm saying? Then right now, before we do anything else, let's let the chains get broken off of us in our life. I want you to spend some time in prayer right now. Would you do it? I'm going to pray with these on the internet right now that are watching and then they're going to shut this off. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus right now, we come first and foremost to repent. We repent of everything that would keep us distracted, that would keep us away from your promise. We repent of sin. We repent of the things that are oppressing us. We repent of the things that we have put above you, God. We repent of those right now in the name of Jesus. We ask you to forgive us. We confess you as our Lord and we confess our sins to you right now. Help us to clean our closets in the name of Jesus. Right now. Whether you're watching online or not. I ask that you would do that. Find that place and you begin to pray. Before I go any farther in this service. Begin to pray.